Uh, from the announcement, this novel is about a terrorist attack, it's about a suicide bombing in Mogadishu, in which the protagonist, whose name is A, he's a Somali United Nations uh, logistics officer, and he dies. And he's got a wonderful relation with his sister, half-sister Bella. And before I say more, you've already explained a bit this uh, importance of freedom and the importance of social responsibility. But before I say more, I'd really love you to listen to Nuruddin Farah's voice. And he's going to read uh, parts from the first chapter. And this is how Bella learns about the death of her half-brother. And uh, it's not the beginning of the novel, but it's the first chapter with herself for asking inappropriate questions at such an inopportune time. But Bella waits to be certain Marcella is down before she says, Ah, oh, was buried the same day he died. What a way to go, says Marcella. This time not even Bella's expression of palpable distress is enough to keep Marcella from continuing in this vein. What a way to end the noble life of a man who served everyone right, honor, and tainted integrity and purpose. At last, Bella Winston takes her first step of the right. Has anyone been in touch with you officially? Bella looks at the blinking answering machine and Marcella goes to it and presses the button to play back the messages. A woman speaking in perfect English with a melodic sounding voice has made several attempts to leave a message. In the most recent, she scarcely gets past Bella's name before she bursts into tears and hands up Second time, she says, Gunilla here. And then, there's been terrible, terrible news from Mogadishu. She breaks off, then attempts to continue stuttering, stopping, and weeping copiously before she again ends up. On the third try, she says her piece as if she were reading from a script. Ah, lost her <coughs> life in a terrorist suicide bombing. The Somali authorities have ordered that his corpse and others will be interred in a mass grave in Mogadishu. Bella utters an Irish curse, wishing the killers hell and worse in the spirit of all the saints of every faith anywhere. This message is followed by several earlier messages from R, who sounded desperate to speak with his sister. At the sound of them, Bella breaks down again. Marcella shushes her, tapping her cheek and then holding her face in the gentle hands until the week ends. And for the first time, Marcella allows herself to wonder to whom the responsibility of informing our children and Valerie will fall. Aloud, she said, would you like me to call the children? Or would you rather you do it yourself? Um, there are, I mean, this book contains so much information about Somalia. To be honest, I went to the, I went to a map, I had a look at all the uh, connections and relations. Uh, I went also to a history book to reread some of this. And um, you write against misconceptions, you write against misunderstandings. And there was a direct, direct uh, reference here when it says. Um, Marcella's questions remind Bella how little even educated Europeans know about Islam. And so there are 
lots of cliches and stereotypes about the veil, about the body tent, as you call it. And in the, the body tent world. didn't exist in secular Somalia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, which of those do you think are the most, uh, the most persistent, the most um, obstinate cliches or prejudices? That we are, it? that we are savages. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what it is. It was when I first went to India, a young man, 1920. I was uh, asked by Indians, "When did you cut off your tail?" <laughs> Literally. Uh, and the first time I was invited to an Indian home, uh, the people who lived in the area came and peeked through as many little holes as they could to find out uh, how I behaved and whether or not, you know, I ate with my feet. In other words, there are all these misconceptions and even when people meet someone like me, and I say I'm Somali, they usually say you are very different. <laughs> and then I would say, how do you know I'm very different? Do you know Somalis? <laughs> oh no, but we, you know, my, uh, that's very different from the you know, conception of... And this, this happens quite a lot and the reason is because there is no communication between peoples. So everybody is locked up in their own little com compartments, you see, and so that uh, comp And then the other thing one must also remember is that uh, in the same way as you have, um, I, was, I was telling Mikhail earlier, that for example, in the young Somalia, when I was teaching in Somalia, I first started teaching at the age of uh, in my uh, mid twenties, a Somali child, from the day he or she was born until university, the education was free. You didn't have to worry about that. Uh, now, obviously, the same is not true now. And therefore, the people, most of the Somalis, and I'm not generalizing about the Somalis who are in this beautiful country of yours, I hope you're kind to them, but, <laughs> but they come from a damaged society, many of them. There was a Somali taxi driver who cut us off earlier, uh, Thomas and I. Now that, you know, there is, there is, there is a change. Somalia has changed. We have changed. Everybody has changed. Now, what I was um, amazed to find at the beginning of the book three photographs that are described, a collection of photographs. And then photography is a constant motive because Bella, as half sister, is a photographer, a fashion photographer. And you explained to me that writing very much goes together with reading. And at that time, you were reading two books. And the one is Holo Barth, and the other one is Susan Sontag uh, on photography. And can you just say what really impressed you about them or what was their, um, what's your own back, do you have a background in photography? What has photography meant to you so far? Or does the idea just come from the uh, from the these essays by Susan Sontag? No, they come they come from the Somali thinking. But rather I shouldn't even confine it to Somalis. Um, you know European anthropologists have a word called primitive peoples. And I'm one of the primitive peoples who believed that being photographed indicates you lose your soul to the instrument that takes a picture of you. Now this is not only, I'm not, when I'm not, when I'm talking about primitives, I don't mean only Africans. I mean, there are many societies that actually believe that photography marks the time 
when death, when death has been able to raise its head courageously in a very brave way. And the reason is the, a photograph points to a past even though it is present. You see? You take a picture of ourselves today, we see the same picture two years later, and then we say, here we were, sitting in that place. But the photograph doesn't have the tenses, the past tense, present, and, and so on and so forth. And then it doesn't even have future tense. So photographs as in tense in time, yeah, because tense also means time. So photograph appealed to me because you could do many things about death with photography that you couldn't do simply writing. And then there is also the continuous alterations in the person, the character, the features, the position from which the photograph is taken. All these are significant in photography. Teaches the children tolerance, um, encourages them to develop their own selves, to carve out their own uh, paths and uh, niches for life. And there is one sentence that really haunted me after finishing this novel, where you say, only these to whom the world is kind are truly able to be kind to the world. And if one looks at R and Bella, um, this is exactly perpetuated in the children Salif and Dahaba, who become wonderful children. Salif is uh, he's so brave, courageous for his age. But what does it mean if we look at the uh, unkindness going on um, everywhere in the world? Doesn't that mean perpetuating the plight? So where do you see the um, a chance for Somalia's future? Where do you see, after having seen so many cultures, so many nations, uh, I've been through so many plights, where do you see a way for the future, a path for the future? Well, let's go back to the sentence. I can't remember the exact words. Uh, but let me say, the sentence, the idea is, to whom the world has been kind, can be kind to the world. Now, the world has been kind to me because at the age of about 20 something, just around 30, I ended up in Italy with not much money in my pocket, uh, not allowed to return home in 1976. From that day on, the world has been kind to me. Opened their doors, I've been given beds, I've been given meals. People smiled at me, taking photographs with me, who lived, you know. That is the world. Now, if you take that even literally, you would find that one of the reasons why these terrorists are killing people is because the world has not been kind to them. You see, if the world has been kind to them, they would be kind in return. 